Today we're going to talk to you about the story of Anna Carolina. I will never forget this story. My husband had been in the United States for several months fundraising and I was alone here and we were working cases after cases. When I'm saying cases after cases, we were working 18, 20 hour days and then getting a few hours for rest and then coming back and working another 18, 20 hour day, executing arrest warrants, uh, running all over the place. It was just non-stop for weeks and weeks on end. And um, it had been about five or six weeks since I'd had a day off. We worked every day, uh, day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out on cases. It was amazing work, amazing rescue. God was just doing absolutely incredible things but there was this one Friday I was so exhausted and I said I'm going to take the weekend off and just as I was getting ready to leave on Friday afternoon we got a case of a 12 year old who'd been raped and I had to take care of that and it was about six o'clock on Saturday night by the time we finished that case and I could go rest and like a mother would say to her children I'm going to take a bath nobody bother me unless the house is on fire or somebody's bleeding I stood in the Guardia that's the entrance to the police where they receive people and I said don't call me unless somebody's dead and I left and it was just getting dark and I came home and I slept Sunday morning I got up I had a slow morning I slept till about 8 o'clock drinking my coffee and then I went and I took a shower and while I was in the shower I heard my phone begin to ring in the living room and I was like I'm putting the shampoo in my hair and I'm scrubbing my hair I'm like oh god please no there's this was a moment where there was no more me I was empty I was gone that was it there nothing left of me I didn't want to see anybody I didn't want to talk to anybody I needed to just be left alone and I'm in the shower shampooing my hair and the phone ring ringing and ringing and then it finally stops and I'm like oh god please don't let it be anything and I get to the point where I've taken the shampoo out of my hair and I put the conditioner on my hair and the phone starts ringing again and I'm praying to God please that's that traffic noise that you're hearing uh, I can't seem to get away from it while I'm doing these videos um, I was just praying please God please God I need a day off please let them leave me alone and the phone stops and I continued my shower and I was finishing up and the phone began ringing again and so I wrapped the towel around me and I answered the phone I looked it was the, the investigators office and they said Gracie we need you um, a husband attacked his wife with a machete and he murdered her in front of the children and we have no car no vehicle to get to the crime scene in Guaymaca and we have no camera to take crime scene photos. This is the reality of life here, where the authorities don't have the resources they need to do what they need to do. And so I said, okay, I'll get dressed. I'm naked, I'm dripping from the shower. Let me get dressed and I'll get in to tell to get you guys. And while I'm getting dressed, the phone rings again and it's the prosecutor's office. And she's saying, Gracie, where are you? And I'm like, I'm getting dressed. You guys called me. I was in the shower. It's my day off. I said, I'm coming as fast as I can. And they actually were screaming that they needed me. So I got to the police station and we loaded up the police and the prosecutors and hopped in the truck and we ran to Guaymaca. And the whole neighborhood was surrounding the house. We had to kind of fight to get the vehicle through the crowd of people and not run anybody over or knock anybody over. And I got in, into the, the crime scene and Gloria was face down in the dirt between the door to her house and the pila. Pila is a cistern that's in the yard that holds water so that they can wash dishes and they can uh, wash laundry. It's usually connected up to the public water system, which is basically a PVC pipe, a one inch PVC pipe. And so I'm giving you these details so you can imagine a yard that's all dirt. There's some uh, mango trees and banana trees in the yard um, then in the middle of the yard there's this pila and there's the back door of the house and there's Anna Carolina lying face down in the dirt and so I was taking the crime scene photos and yes this is going to be graphic because this is real 
this is what we deal with. Um, taking the photos, the forensic doctor was there, and um, they do their forensic evaluation right there on the crime scene and then hand the body over to the family. It's not like you see on TV where they go in and they have an autopsy, and that rarely ever happens in Honduras. So I'm taking the crime scene photos, and he rolls her over so we can see the front, and her body goes one way and her head goes another way. She was decapitated. Her hands were cut off because she was defending herself when he was attacking her. And um, the blood was still fresh. I'll never forget that on the ground. And so I finished taking the crime scene photos, and the investigators were interviewing people, and I went into the house to take care of the family. This is one of the wonderful things about our ministry is that when we're able to be in the middle of a situation, in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of a trauma, that we're able to minister directly to the people who are suffering in the moment. And I'll never forget this. I was sitting in one of them white plastic chairs that they have all over the world. And the little boy, this her son, came over and he put his head on my chest here and he had his right arm around me and his fingers came around to the side here and and his other arm his other arm was up over my shoulder and he was telling me about what he saw and he was telling me and pointing to where he hid while his stepfather was attacking his mother and he was afraid that his stepfather was going to kill him too and the 12 year old daughter was pretty much catatonic the eight-year-old daughter was just sort of running around in shock Anna Carolina's mother was sitting there catatonic too we ended up having to take her to the doctors she collapsed in the middle of all of this and so we were able to take her to the doctors and minister to the family and talk to them we helped them with food and we helped them with education and and went back and we visited th with them after the case but there's an interesting twist to this story and um, the man had been caught and he had run off and the police chased him and he got to this bridge and for some reason he cut his hand off and I'll never forget the the fiscal walking up with a ziploc baggie with his hand in it and turning it over into the back of my truck for the evidence box in the evidence box and seeing just the pieces of stuff body parts that they were picking up off the ground and, and putting into baggies in the back of the truck. But um, several hours later that day, we were at the police station and he was in the jail cell. And there's another story which I want to tell you next week that impacted me so much about these horrendous cases. I don't deal with the aggressors. I deal with the victims, but it may what happened in that other case, which I'll tell you about next week, um, <clears throat> was somebody needed to bring a preacher, a pastor, to come minister to the aggressor. And because of that other case, I decided that whenever we had these horrendous situations, that I would bring a pastor. So I went to a neighboring church to a pastor that we collaborate with and brought the pastor in, got permission from the police to bring him into the jail cell. And I remember standing at the jail cell, my hands on the bars, I was on the outside, my head leaning against the bars. The man was inside holding the bars and he was sobbing and the pastor was sharing the plan of salvation with this man. And he was begging God for his forgiveness. And the man right there said that he wanted to accept Jesus Christ as his savior. And I'm sitting there watching the prayer of salvation in this man who just less than eight hours earlier cut his wife's head off in front of the children. And I'm thinking, this isn't right. This man has done horrible things. He doesn't deserve this. He shouldn't be getting salvation right now and having all this, you know, the anger, the human anger that we have inside of our hearts it was in my mind and I'm thinking this and all of a sudden as I'm sitting there God whispered you don't deserve it any more than he does and in that moment I got the realization 
a more profound realization of how much Christ loves us. That there isn't anything that's too horrendous that we could do that he would not accept us if we repented and came to him. It was a profound moment. And here I was being selfish and it, that moment changed me forever. I don't know how to explain it, but it changed me forever. This man was receiving Christ and later, the next day, uh, I was talking to one of the police officers that works in our office. He had been on guard duty in the night and he said that he heard sounds coming from the jail cell at about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning and he went out with a flashlight and there in the corner of the jail cell was this man face down in the corner crying out to the Lord to forgive him for what he had done. He was sobbing and crying and you know he had received Jesus Christ as a savior. So, so I think what I want to say to you today through this story is that God loves us so much. Christ died for all of us, every single one of us. And it doesn't matter how horrendous the situation is that whatever you've done, there's nothing that you have done that is beyond forgiveness from God if you truly repent. God will be there. And then there's another point I want you to remember. There was no more me when that phone call arrived. I was so empty and so tired of dealing with the darkness and all of these things that I didn't want to see another human being. I did. I could not go another day. And in that moment, the call came. So when you're at the point where you believe that you can't go on anymore, I want you to know that you can step into God's power because that's what I did. I said, okay, Lord, there's no more me. I have to do this. Give me the strength. Give me the ability to step into this work, to step into your power. And I did. I stepped into his power. And I was able to do all of the things that I needed to do, care for the family. Sunday night I got back about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon and I actually was given Monday off and I rested and I was ready to go back to work. I spent time with the Lord. I rested, I slept, I ate. But remember these two things. There's nothing you can do that is beyond the love of Christ for him to forgive you and bring you into the family of God. And number two, when you can't go on, when you can't make another step, when you can't survive another second, in that moment you can step into the power and strength of God and do what needs to be done. Next week we'll tell you another story which brought me to the point of bringing these preachers to jail cells. It's another amazing, terrifying story. But until then, you be blessed, and we'll see you next week.